bringing you in-depth discussion from one of the most read group of online writers covering the Edmonton Oilers. Are you ready for Oilers Overtime? Join us as we talk news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and more, all featured on one of the most glorified teams in the NHL. From the great one to the next one, from the boys on the bus to the decade of darkness, this is Oilers Overtime. Hey everybody, welcome back to Oilers Overtime. My name is Jim Parsons. I'm here with thehotcreators.com. We've got a regular crew back again this week. We've got Tegan Gieselbrecht. How are you doing, Tegan? Great. Good. And Brian Swain is with us. Brian's on the other side of me over here. How you doing? Good, good. And Colton Pankew, how are you doing there, Colton? Good, thanks, Jim. How are you? I'm awesome. Okay, other than the fact that we don't have any games to watch this week, because it's been not the greatest news in terms of COVID protocol stuff, I guess it's what, two players from Montreal that were you know, tested or maybe inconclusive tests, or we're not really sure what's going on exactly, but uh, the game on Monday was postponed, and then we're finding out the game tomorrow is not happening, and they've canceled the game on Friday. So something obviously is going on here. Um, I guess I should start with one of you. We'll go to Colton first. What do you think is going on here? Like, is there any news really released on why they've canceled the entire week's games? Like, do we know if somebody's actually tested positive? Do we have any idea? Have you heard anything in that regard? Um, I think for the most part this season, they're being pretty tight lipped kind of on those things regarding uh, positive tests for players. But I, I do think that obviously for all these games to be canceled already, I think obviously at least one, if not, a few players um, on the Habs from the sounds of it have probably tested positive. And as a result, they're just being as cautious as they can, obviously earlier in the season, especially in the uh, down in the States, there was a lot of games that it kind of spread throughout. So they're just being as cautious as they can at this point, I think. Brian, you got any sense that uh, this might be a total momentum killer for the Oilers? I mean, they had that three little game blip with Toronto, but they've been pretty hot. You know, they've been coming in, beaten and coming back in games like against Winnipeg and they've really just kind of destroyed Ottawa. They've done really well and they were coming in and potentially playing a Montreal Canadiens roster that was depleted with no Tyler Toffoli, no Ben Chirot. Uh, They were kind of wiped out and and struggling, you know, half the time. Uh, Is this a momentum killer for the Oilers? Is this good for the Oilers? Cause they're going to get a chance to practice. I assume, I don't know if they're, the games are postponed if the Oilers can't practice. I assume that they can, but what do you figure in that regard? Yeah, yeah, they can practice. I know there was some discussion. I'm not sure if it's been decided if they're just going to stay in Montreal, if they're even going to come back to Edmonton because they don't play till Saturday. So they have uh, basically the rest of the week off if they chose to do that. Uh, it's a legitimate concern. It's, could it uh, hinder their momentum? It might. Um, as you pointed out, if they have a chance to maybe rest up, heal up a little bit, put in some practice time that maybe they haven't been able to utilize, that could be a positive too. I guess we won't find out. Um, you know, until I take the ice again on Saturday. But uh, it is a shame in the sense that, as you mentioned, they're one of the hottest teams in the league going right now, and they're coming in high off that uh, sweep over the Jets. I think what interests me is uh, if you look at some of the examples around, I mean, this is not, the other's not the first team this has happened to. Uh, we have seen other teams that have had, you know, an entire week of their schedule wiped out unexpectedly because of this. And I think, you know, I don't have – I don't know the stats in front of me. Maybe Tegan has some numbers he can throw my way. But uh, I – from, you know, I think anecdotally anyway, it seems that it has had some – to some degree a negative impact on those teams. Um, or if if at the very least it has kind of, you know, maybe put a, put a pin to deflate some of their momentum. So we'll find out, but it is a legitimate concern, and I'm going to be intrigued to watch how this team comes out of this on Saturday. Yeah, I'm, I'm- – tossed i I don't really know for sure because i we watched edmonton come in to play toronto for three games and they were really hot and they got destroyed by the maple leafs and then we've seen where they've had some really good practices and then they've come out really hot and played really well after struggling so i'm not sure which way to lead tegan what do you think is this one of those things where you know this is good for the others because they play mcdavid and dry settle just like crazy they get tons of ice time darnell nurse is playing 25 minutes a game like smith has been playing like crazy like is this helpful for the oilers to have some time off or do you think this actually hurts the team well from a certain point of view i guess the players getting rest is pretty good i mean this is quite a compact season i understand that they you know they moved around the divisions so that uh not much travel happens like in regular seasons or in seasons prior to this one this was definitely a special case and you know i guess from a certain point of from, from that point of view yeah the players getting more rest is good for them. However, I would say Montreal is teetering on the in, in a playoff spot or not in a playoff spot. And the Oilers could definitely have 
taking control of them. As you mentioned off the top here, that a few players of their few of the star players, important players, were out of the lineup. So I believe it's kind of also hurts the Oilers because they had they had a chance to come out of the, come out of this three game series with at least four points, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't know what it means in terms of when they'll play these games again. I saw Ryan Nugent Hopkins was commenting saying he hopes they play them before what the playoffs, like he, the regular season ends or something like that. Like there might be a chance. Mm-hmm. Brian's kind of nodding over there. Like, do you think they yeah. might extend these games till after regular season ends and then try to fit them in afterwards? Or will they try to squeeze them in somewhere in the schedule? Yeah, Pierre Lebrun was reporting earlier uh, tonight that it looks like they'll try and get them in. They've got a bit of a buffer from when this regular season ends to when the playoffs start. And obviously they put that in there to because Again, the Oilers and Habs are probably not going to be the only team that may be left with games to make up once the regular schedule ends. And that's going to be a concern, I think, because I think there's looking at about a four or five day window between the last day of the regular season and what is supposed to be the start of the playoffs. Now, if they squeeze all three games in there, which it looks like they may have to do because there just isn't a part of, uh, point in the schedule between now and then where the Habs and the Oilers have an overlapping period where they're both off. Um, the Oilers currently finish their schedule with three games and four nights. I think it goes May uh, 3rd or 4th, 5th. They're off the 6th and they play the 7th. Now, if they had to come back out of that and then play three games and say four or five nights against the Habs and then turn around a night or two after that and open up their playoff series against a team that's been rested for a week, that's a bit of a concern. Well, here's my question, Colton. If that is the thing that happens, is this like a playoff vibe early for the Oilers? Because if you have that last few games where you're playing one team, because that's usually how this works, two or three games against one team, and then you go into a three-game series with Montreal, is you is there an opportunity here for the Oilers to actually set themselves up to be prepared for what these playoffs are going to feel like? Because we have to assume at that point they're playing three games. They're probably already in. You know, like I, I there's chances they could come out and they could go on a losing streak. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But uh, we're probably guessing that they were leisure at that point. So is this actually just primer for them for the playoffs or are you like Nugent Hopkins and others that would like to see these games kind of fit in before it gets to that tight a schedule? I think you'd like to see it fit in before. And I think that's just a lot of hockey to play right before um a playoff series potentially i do think that could be interesting like you were saying like i think the oilers would be in at that point but the habs are really one of those costs for them um so that could be really interesting if it does end up coming down to that i think they'll try and fit it in beforehand but if it does those games could be huge now i don't know does anybody know is there a chance they might not play the games like is there a possibility that they don't get those games in i don't know anybody that might know can take it Brian, do you have any I, idea? I don't know. I mean, I think that's something to consider. We see that in Major League Baseball. I mean, because you know, often, you know, with rainouts and whatnot, teams hit the right into the regular season and they might have one or two or three games that they just haven't played. And if it doesn't affect either team in the standings, they won't play them. That's a very interesting question. Another thing that just popped into my mind, too, it's unlikely, but what if somehow, you know, the Habs get really hot, they move up to say the, the third seed, the others are sitting in there, maybe a number two, or it could be a one versus four. These two teams could be potentially shaping up to play each other in the series immediately uh, following that. So, I mean, this is, there's all sorts of angles here that, uh, to watch. That would be something. I don't know if they've determined if the first round of the playoffs is going to be a five or a seven game series, but could you imagine if they played them like 10 games in a row? That'd be, <laughs> that'd be something else. But the reason I ask about those games not potentially happening, because it was where I wanted to go next and pivot a little bit was the, the idea. And we visited this a couple of weeks ago that Connor McDavid may or may not get a hundred points. And I pre- think pretty much all of us said, we thought he'd get close, but he wasn't maybe going to reach that. I don't know how many of you changed your mind since then, but I have. I think he's going to get it. Now, the only reason I don't know if he gets it, if these games don't happen, like if you miss three here or you miss a couple there, now you're taking away an opportunity where Connor McDavid, and it's not just about Connor McDavid, obviously, but you know he's going to need every single one of those games to get to that 100 if he gets to that 100. So my first question, I'll start with Tegan. Do you think he reaches it? And how big could these three games against Montreal be towards him potentially reaching those hundred points. You know, I'm just like you in the same seat in, uh, in regards to switching. Cause I, yeah, I remember that one show we definitely all were like, yeah, it's McDavid, but this season's pretty short. Right. But no, uh, I, I turned around. I totally believe he can get to hundred points. Um, Brian the other day wrote an amazing piece, uh, definitely bringing up the numbers, which, you know, I'm a big fan of obviously. And yeah, it definitely seems like a team will go for McDavid. I share the same concern with you, though, Jim, in the fact that not playing, if these games are canceled, 
those are three less games in a where they have left 22 game season like coming up here to, to the end rather so like losing a three game series would definitely hurt mcdavid's chances throw in there the fact that they no longer play uh the senators that much they have two more games with them to run out this the the season series and those are the bigger nights for McDavid, dry saddle, and the rest and the rest of the crew as well. They have high point nights, and so no longer facing weaker competition coming down the rest of the regular season here hurts his chances. Well, Brian, I'll come to you last because you wrote the article. But Colton, what do you think? Have you switched? Uh, now, were you originally one of those guys that wasn't sure he would get to 100, or did you think he would at the beginning? And where do you sit now? Uh, no, last time we talked, I didn't think he would, and I'll still be the Debbie Downer, I guess. I, I just it's. He's on such a torrid pace right now, and I, I know it's Connor McDavid, and he'll probably prove me wrong. I hope he does. Um, but it's still, even just the pace he would still have to go on, I I think he gets close, obviously. Um, even if they do play those three games against Montreal, I'll say he falls just short. Okay, so Brian, what, what kind of numbers were you pointing at in your article about McDavid and the likelihood that he gets there? What I'm assuming what he has to go point per game for the rest of the season, that kind of stuff. Where were you going with that one? He's got to go at about 1.8 the rest of the way, which is what he's basically done throughout the season. Uh, at the time I wrote it, I think they had 24 games left. He needed, I want to say it was 44. And if you looked at that point in time, the previous 24 games, that was exactly what he had scored. So, I mean, he's proven that he can hold, maintain this pace over this window of time. You know, I mean, obviously anyone can get hot for a week uh, and, and reel off six points in, in three games or seven points or four games or whatever it might have you, but he's proven he can maintain this pace in this condensed season and everything else, all the other challenges that come with it. So it's very possible. Uh, I hadn't, this hadn't even actually, con- uh, I hadn't considered this until you just brought this up, that this could affect his, I'm all team first over here. I'm not about the individual honors. And so, so is he, you know, if you were to ask him, he'd say the same thing. It's not about me. It's about yeah. the team, but well, how can you but, not I mean, watch this? Right. But the thing is, uh, but to, to, to that point, when you got to average 1.8 points per game the rest of the way to get there, now if you take three games out of the equation, that's now he's got to stack on five or six points throughout the rest of these other games. So now you're looking at probably that average goes up to closer to two games he's got to get the rest of the way, so it just becomes that much more difficult. Uh, he had no points in that three-game series against the Leafs, and that really set him back. I thought that was it. I didn't think he'd get back on pace for 100 points after that. He's absolutely erupted here in the in the nine or ten games since then, and that's brought him back onto the pace for 100 points. But I don't think he can afford – he couldn't afford to go, oh, n- no points in three-game series again. So, you know, by extension, if they don't play those three games, that's going to be really, really difficult to make up. Yeah. And, and the, the reason I've switched my, my thinking on this is because of some of the things that you mentioned, one that he was, he's had weeks where he didn't score. Like he was, you know, Oh, four against Toronto. Uh, he's, you know, had games where he was like one point or whatever, but he's also had games where he's like five, six points. Like you mentioned people getting six points in a week. This guy can get six points in a game. Like, and it's not unrealistic to see it. Like when he does it, we're like, Oh, he's just doing the Connor McDavid. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's become a verb. Like it's a, it's a thing, right? To McDavid, the game, like he just can take over the whole game. So I just don't put it past him. Like I, I think it's a, a stretch and I think he could do it, but I just, I look at McDavid and the way that he plays and the motivation he has and how he psychs himself up. He just plays a different, if, if it's close, I just don't want to rule him out. Like, you know what I mean? Cause he's that guy. He can, if he knows he can do it and the rest of the team wants him to do it and he, he can just take over a game. So it will be very interesting to see, but yeah, it's a, uh, a couple of you have sort of stayed where you are. A couple of us have switched, but it's going to be a very interesting race. It's going to be super close, way closer than most of us probably thought when we first asked that question. Okay, so I posed a question to you guys before we got on the air here today about uh, what you might want to talk about that might be irking you. Get it off your chest, we'll call it. And the reason I said that, because there's something I want to get off my chest. So I can go first or last. I don't care what you guys want me to do, but... Uh, I figured if I'm going to do it and vent and I'm going to look right at the fans when I do it, uh, I figured maybe you guys might want to do it too. So are you guys all cool with that? Have you picked a, a, a moment or a something this season to get off your chest? Do you want me to go first? Cause I'm, I'm itching to get this out. <laughs> yeah. You go first. Okay. Hey, I think you, I, yeah, the floor is yours. Oh my God. Okay. I, I'm going to do my best not to swear. 
Cause it's just what it's been driving me crazy all season long. And I'm so, I got into it. Like I don't get into very many social media wars with anybody. And this wasn't a war, but it was a, a heated debate. Let's call it that way. The Tyson Berry argument that his second assists and his power play points don't count. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I don't understand the argument. I get that he doesn't have the greatest underlying numbers, but his underlying numbers have been decent this year. And, and Tegan will tell me, hopefully, that he's got some of those things pulled up. But what I do know is that this is an elite offensive defenseman who's shooting the puck like crazy. He's got 98 shots for the team so far. I think that's third, like, on the entire team, which is exactly what we've always been complaining about with the Edmonton Oilers. They don't shoot enough. So now we've finally got a guy who can play on the power play, which we needed. He shoots like crazy. You don't got to ask him twice. He's like third in points per game. He's only got two penalty minutes on the seasons for everybody that says he's such a bad defensive player. He's been able to shut people down in some form without taking penalties. So, I mean, tell me how many other players are able to do that and be the worst defensive player in the league. So I get that everybody's coming in from Toronto saying that Tyson Berry was this or that, and he's not very good as underlying numbers don't reflect. Yeah, fine. But man, count it for what he is and be appreciative of the fact that you have him. This is the kind of player that the Oilers have been looking forward to having forever. And they finally got him. And for whatever reason, some contingent of the fans, and for any of you that are watching this, I'm talking to you. Why the hell do you want to run this guy out of town? Like, what is going on? You're talking about trading this guy already? Yeah, you don't sell high when you're in the middle of a playoff race. You don't sell high when you've got a player that you've been looking for forever. He offers you so many things you didn't have. You need to at least have some sort of a leash for some of the things that he doesn't bring you, which you knew he wasn't going to bring you when you signed him. Like, I don't understand that. Now, I'm going to let you guys tell me how many of you, and you're welcome to disagree with me, Tegan, Brian, Colton, whoever wants to can do it. Uh, I just, it drives me nuts when the fans do this because I am a huge diehard Oilers fan. I'm the first to be critical when there's a lot of things that are going wrong. I just don't see why you would choose to be critical of Tyson Berry and overlook all the good things that he has done so far this year. Am I totally off base here? Tegan, what do you think? Am I nuts? Well, in the very first show we had here, I mentioned how uh, a, a big portion of the Oilers fandom is not a big fan of Ryan Newton Hopkins. And it just seems like, why? Why not? This guy's been performing for you at what you need to, right, over all the seasons. And so I totally agree with you that sometimes Oilers fans are early to, to, to um, who are really – on the team, I guess, inside of rushing a prospect, but also the opposite side, opposite side of the fence of that is that they want to take their sweet time. Tyson Berry, as you mentioned, is the type of offense or offensive defenseman that they've been looking for for seasons, but then they once again just want to turn their backs on him quickly, faster than they did in R&H, and they want to switch on him and just say, no, run him out of town and trade him for whatever you can get. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with you. Yeah, I just it would be one thing if you had three other Tyson Berries and you could afford to move one, but you don't. Mm-hmm. You've got Ethan Bear, you've got Evan Bouchard, you've got other people who maybe can step in and play that role, but we don't know that yet. We have no idea what these guys are going to be. We have no idea if they can take over that much. And he's playing a lot. Like for people that say he doesn't play full-time five on five, he's playing first pair minutes, 21 minutes a game this guy's playing. So yeah, he's not expendable. Like that's just the deal. Brian, what do you think? Am I crazy? No, no, I, you know, I would double down on what you say. I'm, I'm going to add some points to your argument. In fact, I mean, the, for so long, you, you listed all the things that people have wanted for so long, you know, a guy who shoots a lot and an offensive defenseman, people wanted a right shot defenseman. They got that. Uh, you know, how long has, how many years were, you know, I'm old enough to remember when uh, others could not attract players like this. He chose to come here. He chose to sign here. He wanted to be part of this team. Uh, and, and further to this point, I don't think it's uh, no, it's no small accident or not no small coincidence, I should say, that Connor McDavid is putting up the numbers. He is playing with Tyson Berry on the power play. I think he's, you know, not that I'm giving credit to, to him making McDavid the greatest player, but he might be responsible for four or five, six more points he picks up over the season. If you look back um, in the days of Wayne Gretzky, his greatest offensive seasons were correlated with when he played a lot on the power play with Paul Coffey and Paul Coffey put up monster numbers. That's not coincidental. He makes, he takes players that are already great and he's helped make them even greater. And uh, this is just what the others have been looking for for so long. And yeah, I just, 
As far as the whole second assist things go, I, you know what, if you want to take the second assist off and um, take that away or not give him credit for those and use that as an argument against him, well, guess what? Every other great offensive player in the history of the game, take their second assist away too and then see how they stack up. You know, I mean, I just, I don't understand any of these arguments. So there you go. See, I'm getting, I'm getting flustered now. That's too. good. That's the point. You know, and, and yeah. the thing about the second assist that I didn't say when I went on my little rant at the beginning <laughs> is that everybody discounts the fact that second assists don't, ever do anything like they're totally irrelevant they're hugely which is not they're not the deal i mean there are some really really skilled second assists that happen in the there game are and i can assists. guarantee you tyson berry's done some of them yeah there are second assists mm-hmm. that are more valuable than first assists yeah tell so, me on our power play that there's not times that that second assist is critical to setting up that goal yeah it's it is and so anybody who just says ah oh, it's a second assist it doesn't count oh whatever all right colton what do you think am i nuts no, I, I completely agree. Like Brian said, uh, they've been looking for a puck-moving defenseman or their fans for this long. They got him at a bargain deal, and they're complaining about him. I, I don't get it either. I'm with you. Okay, so I'll I'll stick with you, Colton. Do you want to go next? with If it was the same, that's cool. If it's different, yeah. what's your get-it-off-your-chest moment? No, mine's the uh, the heart race. And with Connor McDavid, I'd seen the NHL.com had put out a poll the other day, and there's a lot of people talking about it that are seeming to give the heart to Patrick Kane, who is having a great season. Like Chicago, without him, would I thought they are going to be maybe the worst team in the league this year. But it's just crazy. Like He's on pace for – was on pace, and he he's probably even more higher now, but he was at 144, and it's like – that's the best season we've seen in how long. I don't understand how it's not getting more heart consideration. I think it's, and you see a lot of the arguments of people saying, yeah, but he plays with dry sidle and Kane's by himself. And I mean, Gretzky, when he was winning heart trophies or Lemieux, Lemieux had yogurt, Gretzky had curry, cur- or, uh, coffee, like all these guys. It's just, I, it doesn't make sense to me. It's like dry sidle last year. There was a lot of people complaining about him getting the heart saying it was a factor of McDavid. And like, it almost seems like some of these people are just, you have to play on a terrible team by yourself in order to win the heart trophy. And I just don't get it. Yeah, I'm with you. And I, I love, I got to give credit and a shout out to the Oilers Twitter social media manager, because I don't know if you guys saw it when somebody in the NHL put up that poll between Patrick Kane and Connor McDavid. And all they did was put an LOL. Like, as <laughs> in, like, yeah, right. Uh, it's not, I mean, Patrick, you're right. Patrick Kane has had a fantastic season and Chicago is coming back down to earth a little bit, but Nobody expected them to be where they are. And so that that's in a major Patrick Kane is hugely responsible for that. That said, heart trophy winners are typically really obvious, right? And I don't know how you don't pick Connor McDavid. It just doesn't, I don't know how you consider anybody else. There might be people close to second and third, but it's Connor McDavid all the way. I don't know. Brian, what about you? What are your thoughts on that with Colton? Yeah, I was a little bit baffled when I saw that. And it wasn't that it was even close. I mean, he, I think if I remember right, Colton, you can correct me here, but he, Patrick Kane had a pretty wide margin yeah. uh, that he was <laughs> yeah. leading by in that. Um, and it just, I don't know, I couldn't figure it out. Like, is it just because Patrick Kane's maybe more of a feel good story? The Blackhawks weren't expected to do anything. He's kind of entering into the, or, you know, into his later years. And maybe people were thought he'd lost a step. And he's, as you say, I mean, I don't want to make this anything about, you know, talking negative or dissing Patrick Kane. He's playing fantastic. And I think uh, a tremendous season, but it's, it's not even close. Uh, Connor McDavid, you just go back over all the points we've made already in the this talking tonight about the incredible, unprecedented things he's doing. This is, this is like could shape up to be a generational season. So I'm just puzzled. Uh, Patrick Kane, good on him. He's doing amazing things, far exceeding what anyone thought he could do this year. But uh, McDavid is your Hart Trophy winner. That's period. That's it. Tegan, you might you might know, and maybe you don't because he didn't get it ready, but you might know some of the numbers with the Patrick Kane, Connor McDavid argument. What's your take on Patrick Kane versus Connor McDavid here? Well, if you just look number wise, yeah, McDavid's got uh, he's got sixty points. He's tied with um, Austin Matthews with twenty one goals, so that's tied for first. And uh, he's the, he's leading the league in assists as well with thirty nine, and has I believe Drysaddle is just like three behind him. For, for assists and Dreisaitl is also throwing their 10 points shy at them for second for point totals. So I understand 
somewhat just a little bit i don't want i don't want colton going off i mean but understand a little bit as to why people say well he plays with mcdavid how that works out point wise i do believe that that working playing on the same line is a intriguing argument in the fact that yeah that's where a lot of the points are coming from if they were on their own lines that might play a little bit differently but i but to compare them to, to i i can't i can't i just can't understand it um, it, it's by far and away Connor McDavid. I know we had a four game slump there uh, versus Toronto in the game before that as well, but I, it's, it has to be McDavid in the season. I mean, I have no control over it. I don't have a vote, unfortunately. Uh, we have to wait a few months for that to come out. It's a regular season award, is it not? At least that's the way I believe it should be treated. So I hope McDavid gets it. Obviously, all of oil country does, and that's the way I see it. All right. Uh, that's a good point, Colton, for sure. I saw that, and I was thinking it when I saw it, too. I didn't think to bring it up tonight, but that's a good one. Uh, Tegan, we'll stick with you. What's your get-it-off-your-chest moment? Is it the same as one of the two that we've mentioned so far or something different? It's funny because my the one I have is similar to yours, but my, my backup was the hard trophy uh, conversation. I didn't really di- I didn't want to dive into it too much, but I'm, I'm glad Colton brought it up. Um, now, this one, now you guys brought up great arguments. Mine is a little bit far-fetched, so hang in there with me, okay? So it's... What, something that bothers me is that Darnell Nurse and Tyson Berry are not in the discussion for the Norris Trophy, uh, the tr- like nominations this year. Um, so far, I, I believe that they both should be. They both have very compelling arguments uh, when it comes to their stats, how their styles of play, what Berry means to the first unit power play for the Oilers, uh, which is currently operating with top five in the league at number five with 27%. In another year, this might have been number one, but this year some teams have been playing better, so they, uh, that's why they're sitting at five. I believe that Nurse and Barry both have a chance at being the Norris winners, but I'm for, like it's pretty obvious that Victor Hedman is most likely going to end up the winner. He has, you know, has his own self argument for as points as well but yeah in some of these categories Barry's is slightly behind him and then nurse is slightly behind Barry as well so I don't, I'm, I'm not understanding the 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 lackluster the lack of suggestions I guess I would put it as to why these guys aren't considered for this trophy yeah no I hear you I'm uh as far as I went with the Tyson Barry argument I may not go with you on the Norris conversation but I'm with you with Darnell Nurse I think he has played outstanding hockey, both offensively, defensively. He's scoring goals like crazy. He's shutting people down. He's playing 25 minutes a game. Uh, he's critical to the Oilers. He is that number one defenseman that they have needed for a long, long time. And he's turned into that. This His game is just every season progressed and progressed and progressed to the point where he's at that point now that I think the argument could be made that he's there. So I'm with you on Nurse. I'm not quite sure I'm there on Tyson Berry, although I like that player a lot. Uh, but I, I think there are other defensemen, like you said, Victor Hedman, and those guys that are in the conversation a little bit before Barry would be. Uh, Colton, what's your take on the Norris Trophy talk? Uh, I agree with you. Like, you. like you guys both said, Barry's obviously having a fantastic year, but I think if either of those defensemen were to be a finalist, I'd be uh, giving it to Nurse for sure. I know sometimes, not sometimes, most times it kind of has turned into more of a point trophy. They would get on just for that reason. But I think if you had to pick just who's been their best defenseman, it's been Nurse. And Brian, what about you? Yeah, I I mean, for me, it's Hedman. Uh, not even close. Uh, but I, I got to give credit to Nurse. I think is playing fantastic. He's having a season that far exceeded. I think it still succeed, exceeds what people give him credit for. Um, you know, what, what's he at now? 11 goals, I think it is. Yeah, I think so. Uh, through 10 or 11 he's I mean there's only been three players in uh, Oilers history that have scored 20 goals or defensemen in Oilers history that scored 20 goals in an entire season he's actually on pace for that you know he's up there with Paul Coffey uh Charlie Huddy Sheldon Surrey the only ones that have done it so that's just that just shows you the level he's playing at and he's playing the best defensive hockey of his career too as an NHL player so tremendous season for nurse um you know barry we've made the case for but um you know i i think they'd have as good a case as anybody is potentially being if i'm not sure how they're doing the awards this year if it's like one nominee per division um but they would certainly be in the conversation for the top defenseman i think in the northern division and just to be clear tegan you weren't actually arguing that you think darnell's nurse would win you're just arguing he should be in the conversation is that right in, in the conversation, I don't see him in any top five. Occasionally, he's in the top 10 at number 10 list. 
I, I feel like these guys are being, you know, not valued as much as they are. And I know they're, they're paired together uh, more often than not. And as I said, they, they both run different power plays and it's just, they're not getting the respect that they deserve. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, anytime the team is really good, uh, especially in the North division, people tend to diss or love Toronto. People tend to diss or love the Oilers when they're doing well. It's just the way that it goes. Right. So some people are going to get overlooked just like with David, right. He's getting overlooked because everybody assumes, well, he's going to be in that conversation every year. Maybe we should look at somebody who isn't right. Uh, Brian, have we covered your get it off your chest moment or do you have a different one? Yeah. My chest is cleared. <laughs> You're feeling good. You've got all the passageways <laughs> emptied out. You're good. Yeah, all right. yeah. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So let's shift to one more, um, conversation and i'll i'll intro some of this in case any of you didn't get the chance to read it jonathan willis wrote a very interesting article on the athletic uh, it was either today or yesterday and he talked about some of the five biggest questions that the oilers might have to answer before the trade deadline and among them were they good enough in net uh, are they good enough at center do they need another top six forward uh do the prospects get a chance to play this season and what would they do during the upcoming expansion draft so I'm going to let each one of you decide uh, which one of those five questions you think is the most important. And then, you know, in a matter of maybe a couple of minutes, tell me what you might do in that situation. So Tegan, I'll start with you. Um, are they good enough in net? Are they good enough at center? Do they need another top six forward? Do the prospects get a chance to play or what will they do with the expansion draft? Which one of those do you want to try to tackle? Uh, I'm going to try to stick in between the pipes, talk about the goaltending situation they got going. Uh, Mike Smith, he had his 39th birthday just this past Monday. So, you know, happy, happy belated birthday to him. But I believe he's done well enough this season. His record's 11, 3, and 0. Uh, so his save percentage is 0.922, which is good for 12th in the league. And his goals against average is 2.34, uh, which is 16th in the league. And he's been, he's been playing pretty good. Like, as I said, his record is 11 and 3. There's only three games this season that he's lost. The, the issue is I don't want to see him go the way that Cam Talbot did back in the 2016-17 uh, season where he's kind of ran into the ground. I'm, un- I'm aware that it's not an 81 or, sorry, 82 uh, regular season as it used to be uh, this year as it is short into 56. But I, I feel like if they don't play Mike Smith too much, he will definitely be ready come playoff time if they're in a playoff spot, which I, I believe they will be. My big issue is with Koskinen not getting enough starts. He is 9-10-0. and 10 and 0. His numbers are worse. And I believe if, if if Mike Smith suffered an injury or if he was played the last like 10 games going into playoffs, he didn't have enough time to recuperate that if Koskinen was put in net to start that he wouldn't, he might not have it by that time of the season. So that's my, that's my biggest issue is goaltending. Like I'm a big Mike Smith fan now because of the way he's playing at 39. Gotta love the guy. He's practically the NHL's version of Tom Brady minus championships, but you know, he's pretty darn good at this old age. <laughs> But it's it's definitely interesting to see how they're going to play him and how they're going to balance him and Koskinen when it comes to, OK, we're in a playoff spot. We want to stay healthy and keep performing the way we were into the postseason. Yeah, that's a very interesting take. And I'll, what I can gather from what I'm reading with the coach and the situation with Mike Smith and stuff like that is even if Smith does somehow falter later on, we're only going to find out when it's too late. Right. Because I think he's played well enough now that they aren't going to make a move here before the trade deadline. There's just no reason that they would do that. Mike Smith has played so well. Dave Tibbet has so much confidence in him that the wheels are going to have to fall off here in the next week, which we probably won't even get a chance to see without these Montreal games now, that they would have to really, really doubt that Mike Smith is capable. Like, just something has happened. Something's fallen off. He was injured, whatever. Knock on wood that none of those things happen. Um, and then, but I think with the Koskinen point, he probably will get a chance to play, especially with these games postponed now, because Brian brought it up, right? How tight that, that schedule is at the end. And then if you add those Montreal games in, there's just no way that they're going to run Mike Smith through that whole thing. Right. Like they're not, if there's six games and eight nights or six games and nine nights or whatever, you're going to have to split those two guys up. So hopefully even if Mike, if Nico Kostin doesn't get all the games uh, from here till the next three or four weeks or so, he's going to get a lot at the end, right before he needs to be warmed up for the playoffs. It's my hope. Uh, but that's a good point. I'm with you. I don't think that they're going to be making any change. I think they think they're good enough in net this year. Long-term, who knows? I even think Mike Smith's played himself into another contract if everything stays kind of consistent. So um, I'm not really sure. Brian, you want to go next? Do you have a uh, one of the five that you want to touch on? Yes. 
Well, I'll maybe go with the expansion draft um, because this thing blows my mind. Like, there's so many different wrinkles and twists this year. I was joking when you were before the show that I was going to have to cram for this part of it because I'm still trying to understand all the little nuances of this. There are so many fascinating questions that come around this, though, in, in terms of who they protect, you know, who's eligible to protect, who do you want to expose. I think uh, focusing maybe particularly on Oscar Klefpa, Um now, there's, there's a number of different ways this could play out, and I may be wrong. If anybody, please jump in if I uh, correct me if I'm going off on this. But I think now they could get an exemption because he's a veteran with a, who's suffered a potential career threatening injury. I know there's a wrinkle for that. I'm not sure if he could be exempt from it. Um, now, they, let's say they decide that even if they know he can come back, um, is it too risky to keep him? Do you want to use one of those uh, one of your slots to use to protect him when you don't know what he's going to be like when he returns, even if he is clear to play? If you do expose him, is that somebody that Seattle is on? Um, uh, let's put it on the flip side. Let's say you do want to keep him, but you want to make sure you protect Nurse, you protect Bear. Could you expose him and trust that Seattle might not take it, might not grab him anyway? given the fact that you don't know what his future was, is Seattle going to be wanting to take on that risk with that contract, not knowing what they're getting in him? So there's a lot of fascinating questions around that. And of course, whatever you do with clip bomb effects, who else can protect other, other, elsewhere, whether you go with uh, the seven forwards and then three defensemen, or if you're going to protect the eight skaters. Um, really fascinating, interesting questions, I think. And a lot of that thing is going to, you know, what we see from other players down the stretch here, too. I'd be curious to get anybody else's take on, you know, just how, who would you protect? Yeah, uh, well, you cut it out a little bit there, Brian, but I think that what I caught most of what you were saying here is that there's real concern over what Oscar Kleffbaum is going to be able to do after his surgery, which you always haven't officially announced yet, but they are going to when it's over. Uh, there's arthritic issues here that may be long-term issues that may mean he never comes back and this is the same player again. Uh, do you protect him? Do you not protect him? Uh, is he exempt? And I don't know about the, maybe one of you guys do, but I don't know for sure if that's been figured out yet, the exemption, because basically in the rules, it says it has to be a career ending injury. And that's based on a number of games uh, for the season. And with this prorated season and the, the condensed schedule, I don't know that they actually know, where they're going to draw that line with players and whether they're going to qualify him as a career ender. That said, I'm with you. I don't think they protect him. I think a lot of people assume that they will, but I don't know that they're super confident. And I get the hint from things that Holland has said and the way others inside that club and organization close to it have talked. There's real doubt that Clef Bomb's going to be the same guy again. And there's talk. I heard Bob Soffer and Oilers now say that there's even concern that he's going to be able to live a normal life like he's going to have normal use of his shoulder and all that other stuff. If, and when wow. the surgery goes as it's supposed to go. Now, when I say normal life, he'll be able to do all the regular things that most people can do, but can he play professional hockey at the NHL level? That's a huge question. And I don't know that anybody really knows the answer to that. And they may not know for a while. And if I'm Seattle, I'm not risking it. Like I just don't, I don't imagine that if there's any question mark at all, that Cliff bomb is not going to be able to come back and he maybe plays a little bit and then has to leave again. I wouldn't take him. So if for me, I would probably not leave him. I would leave him exposed. Uh, that's my thought. Uh, Colton, what do you think? Uh, do you have a thought as to what the Oilers might do when it comes to the defenseman or Clef Bomb at the expansion draft? Yeah. I think, um, I think the um, – I, I think if Nurse wasn't having the season that he was, he's really kind of turned into that number one defense and like you were talking about, I think it might be a bit more of a question, but um, I, I think with how good he's playing, I think they will leave him unprotected. Um, it'd be too bad if he got claimed because really I think Clefbaum's on a great deal when he's healthy and at his best. But like you said, it's really anyone's guess as to how he's going to be. I think it's interesting because he just did have surgery. So I, I would be curious to see in a couple months time kind of how he's doing off of that. If it did help. Um, I know they were, they were obviously with it happening as late as it did, they weren't even sure they wanted to go that route because they weren't sure if it would resolve any issues. But uh, yeah, I mean, from how everything's sounding, I don't see why you'd waste a protection spot on him at this point, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, even if he does come back normal, I guess what the question I'm asking, if I'm Seattle, 
is, is this worth taking a chance, right? Like you mm-hmm. only get to do this once, right? And if you pick wrong and you find out that he isn't good to go, uh, then you've, you've blown a spot on a, a player who may not play for you. Uh, Tegan, what's your thought? Do you think the Clef Bomb question is a real issue? Do you think they worry about something else in expansion? Well, I would leave him unprotected personally. And if I was Seattle, I'd take uh, Chris Jones or, um, oh, sorry, not Chris Jones, Chris Russell rather, or Caleb Jones uh, over taking the Clef Bomb, as you mentioned, because he's going to be, you know, still, still out there, whether he is good to go or not. Um, when it comes to protecting other forwards and stuff, like, yeah, they've, they've got other players on the roster that they've got to deal with, like, now that I know uh, Alex is on a great is on a great deal money-wise, but, yeah, they've got other issues and talent to think about moving forward. All right, cool, and I think you're the final one for the uh, the question of what uh, what's the most pressing question. Is it the good enough in net, good enough at center, need a top six forward, prospects getting a chance to play, or the expansion draft, which would you like to cover? Uh, obviously I, I've been pretty, I, I really want them to get a centerman. Um, Eric Stahl, I think would be fantastic. I know it's Canadian market and we're really running out of time to make trades here, given the 14 day quarantine. But I was just, when they had signed Kyle Turris this off season, I was really excited. Uh, I thought he'd be a great fit. And obviously it just has not, wasn't working out at all. Hasn't worked out at all. So I think if they could bring in a third line center, that'd be fantastic. But I mean, with how close the deadline is, like it probably won't happen. Yeah. I'm actually very curious to see how many trades actually go down. You know, like yeah. I love trades for anybody that reads my stuff with the hockey creators. That's kind of how I make my living. I talk about rumors and trades and I talk about <laughs> the Oilers. And if there's not a lot of trades on trade deadline day, I don't know what I'm going to do, but um, I do think that there are a few players out there, but Eric Stahl is one of those guys where I think the hype at the very beginning was really, really high. And now I'm wondering what return there's even going to be for Buffalo. It might be a fourth round pick if anything. Yeah. And I don't know what teams he's going to go to. Cause it sounds like everybody's kind of concerned about his age and the Canadian stuff. So I have no idea. I, my guess is if he goes anyway, he might go back to Carolina, but yeah, I'm with you. I think the Oilers could definitely use a third line center. I think that there's some question marks as terms of the depth, like with Jujar Kara and Gaetan Haas. And what do you do if you're running McDavid and dry settle one, two, but then all of a sudden Tippett decides to put dry settle and McDavid together. That second line is yikes. Like it's not exactly, you know, a confidence builder. Uh, yes. Yeah, Nugent Hopkins is a good second line center, but I don't know what you do third line. If you don't can't count on Kara or Haas to be consistent throughout the run. Right. So I'm with you all the time. We would normally go to Brian in this section, but we've had a little bit of Wi-Fi issue this week with Brian's feed. So I want Brian to get the chance to really answer this question in full detail without cutting out. And so that everybody can hear what he's going to say. So unfortunately, Brian, I'm sorry to do this to you. We're going to get you on the first part of next week's show. And we'll ask you this question to open up the video and we'll let everybody hang with bated breath on what your answer is going to be. You cool with that? Awesome. All right, guys. Well, that's going to do it. That was our last question anyway. So that's going to do it for us this week on Oilers Overtime. Don't forget, like, subscribe to the video, share this with other people. Go on thehockeyreaders.com and check out all the articles about the Oilers. There's tons of good stuff on there right now as well. Check out other videos on YouTube with the Chicago Black Guys, Detroit Red Wings, Calgary Flames, Toronto Maple Leafs. There's so much good content. I do a rumors post every weekend. Uh, Hockey Raiders Live is going on too. So there's tons of good stuff you guys can watch. And join us next week, uh, Wednesday, for Oilers Overtime. We'll have another edition. For now, thank you guys for coming out. Thank you guys for joining us again, and we'll see you next week.